recession, interest rates, market crash. I mean, there are so many different things that we are hearing nowadays that can cause fear in your life. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Graham Stephan. He is an individual on YouTube with over 4 million subscribers. And a lot of his videos have to do with the markets, the crash, the financial stability, anything that you could possibly think about with, with the economy and housing he talks about. And so today we're going to go through his YouTube video that we're linking below and give our reactions and our thought process from a home builder that has been in this economy and the market since 1990. So Graham, let's do it. What's up Graham, it's Guys here, and the housing market is continuing to get worse. For example, you now need to make more than $107,000 a year to afford the average home in the United States. Home builder sales have collapsed by 46% as companies begin to walk away from their future land deals, and month over month, prices are falling for the first time since 2012. Now, just even starting off with the video, again, this is from our perspective, he said, things tend to get worse and worse. And there is a lot to digest within that. But when we go back to January of this year, from our perspective, January was actually one of the best months that we have had in nine months. Again, it was, it was a great month. We did hit some hurdles and some stumbling blocks late in the fourth quarter in 2022. So I completely agree with what he's talking about. And this video did get published February 24th. So I assume he's going off of some of those statistics. But also looking at that, when you look at some of the large public home builders like DR Orton, they had more sales in a single week in January than they have had in the past three years. Now, this is just from a sales standpoint. I know there's a lot more to digest, like what are the incentives that they're giving away? How much are they marking off? But when it comes from a sales standpoint, January actually had a very large uptick along with February and March. Again, this video was made in February, so he didn't quite have the analytics and the numbers for February and March, but we'll continue in the video. The good news is that you could finally buy a home in Oahu for less than a million dollars. Well, I have to say that my wife really wants to move to Hawaii, so I, we really need to cut that part out so my wife doesn't see that. And... Just consider this. A year ago, the average person had to make an income of $76,000 a year to be able to afford the average home here in the United States. But with mortgage rates now passing 7%, at today's prices, that same person would have to make an income of $107,000 a year to purchase that exact same home. So he brings up a great point. Yes, interest rates have skyrocketed along with home prices going up. So you have to look at these issues and say, okay, how can we come up with a solution when we have these hurdles? And that's why as a home builder, we are offering incentives when it comes to an interest rate buy down. Yes, a lot of builders, they will mark down the prices of their homes, which will help to a certain extent. Where we see the best affordability for consumers on a month to month basis is actually doing a multi percentage buy down on your interest rate. Now, a weird statistic for us here on a local level in Colorado Springs, our most expensive community is actually our best selling. So I know affordability is always in people's minds, but it is just a weird thing how, again, most expensive community coming in with the best sales. I don't know. There's still buyers out there within the market. So it's just trying to decipher through all this information. Generally, lenders need to make sure that less than 45% of your income goes towards housing. So for every $1,000 you make, $450 of that at the very most can go towards the property. This is also what's known as your debt to income ratio. And it's incredibly important that you understand this calculation because it's basically the E equals MC squared of the real estate market. As an example, let's just say you make $6,000 a month and you want to buy a property that's $450,000. In this case, your total housing payment would be $3,000. $174 a month with 15% down at a 6.8% interest rate, including property taxes and insurance. Graham brings up a great point when you're trying to break down your monthly payment. Now, one thing, I know he's trying to keep it generic and basic level for everyone, but one thing that you guys want to keep in your mind is property taxes. You know, for instance, El Paso, where we build in Texas, is some of the highest property taxes that you will see when purchasing a home, but right next door, just about an hour away in Las Cruces, New Mexico, is some of the most affordable property taxes where we build in, which is going to drastically change your mortgage payment on a month-to-month -month level. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Now, before we dive into the specific cities about to see the largest declines, in terms of pricing, a recent index found that just 38% of homes sold between October and December were affordable to U.S. families earning the median income of $90,000. Because of that, agencies like CoreLogic gather sales 
data on a monthly and annual basis to determine just how much and where prices are expected to fall. And as they found, so far, Idaho is the only state to post a year-over-year -year decline in prices, with just about every other location posting an average month-over-month -month decline of 0.4%. When Graham is talking about falling prices, there is something that I want to input into that is, you know, through COVID, we saw this drastic increase in prices, and we knew that wasn't maintainable. But from a consumer standpoint, they look at it and they say, oh, corporate greed, or you guys are just increasing prices for profit, this and that. You know, today, our prices are drastically increased from 2018, 2019, even doubled in some areas. But our profit margin percentage is actually lower. Yes, we are doing incentives to move some of the homes and with the prices increasing, things of that nature, but it doesn't mean that our profit percentage has increased drastically. Like I said, it's actually lower. The pricing of materials has drastically increased and us from a home building standpoint, we haven't seen the relief that we would want in order to bring those prices back down to where we were pre-COVID. You know, just for an example, within our HVAC, we went from one community to the next. We're talking in just a couple month differential where our HVAC costs on our homes in some of them not even doubled, but tripled in cost. And so a lot of these things are adding up and that's where we have to be very careful. Yes, we wanna get the prices back down to affordability, but how do we do that in such an era and time like this while still keeping people employed? This is just a fine type rope that we are trying to walk day in and day out. The National Association of Realtors said that markets in roughly half the country are likely to offer potential buyers discounted prices compared to last year. So for anyone looking to purchase a home in the near future, this is really good news. For instance, San Francisco has already seen a 14% price drop from the peak, Seattle's fallen 13%, San Diego is down 10%, and Phoenix slash Denver is tied for 8%. But where this gets concerning is when you begin to look at national levels, because several metrics are dropping, and fast. One thing to make note on Graham's topics here, he is taking everything from a national level and a national average, which is about all that he can do, but there's these heavily populated areas like San Francisco, LA, New York, that is going to skew these numbers so drastically that it's not truly accurate to your local area. You know, for instance, I keep bringing up El Paso. El Paso is one of the most affordable cities in the United States. And so a lot of these numbers that he is talking about is not going to be relevant to us in El Paso. Even to us here in Colorado Springs, which is only about 45 minutes to an hour south of Denver, we have a drastically different market than the numbers he is representing when it comes to Denver. The New York Times recently posted a feature describing the reality that anyone who already owns a piece of real estate has very little reason to sell it right now. And I completely agree. Homeowners are currently able to charge a high rent relative to a low mortgage rate and equivalent properties are almost impossible to find at the same monthly payment. That means as long as they're not cash flow negative, homeowners can afford to rent out their home with the mindset that they'll be able to hold off long enough for the market to recover. Now, of course, the downside is that for landlords, competition is picking up with one Airbnb manager who's stunned that half of his homes were empty over Super Bowl weekend, even after dropping the price from $1,200 down to $500. One note to make on the Airbnb thing is cities are starting to regulate Airbnbs and the ability for individuals to rent out their homes. Again, here in Colorado Springs, it is so regulated that it is almost impossible to do short-term rentals for Airbnb. They're almost forcing you to go more of a midterm, like over 30 days, unless you were grandfathered in or have the proper licensing. So that could also skew some of the rental numbers from Airbnb. I also think it's incredibly important that we get as many different perspectives as possible. So I flew all the way to New York City to get Barbara Corcoran's thoughts on the current housing market as someone who's been in the real estate market for 50 years with over $4 billion in sales volume. Here you go. Do you believe that rents though would go down for people who can't sell their home they don't want to get rid of their mortgage at 3%, so they'll mm -hmm. rent their home. Don't you mm -hmm. think that excess inventory might suppress prices? No, it's just not enough. First of all, think of that circumstance. Someone's living in a home and wants to rent their home. Very mm -hmm. few people are comfortable with that. They typically sell or need the money to get something else. So no, not enough inventory. Yeah. There really is uh, the biggest bottleneck in the market right now is shortage of inventory. It sounds absurd, right. but not enough listings coming on market to choose from. Yeah. Barbara hit it right on the head right here. What she's talking about is the inventory levels here in the United States. That is something that is drastically different from now to back in 2008. Right now, we are so under inventoried or the demand demand is so great that we aren't able to produce enough homes for the demand that there is out there in the market. Like I said earlier, you know, we did 
did see the slowdown due to the rate increases throughout the country, but something that is different than 2008 also is the demand is still there. We still have people coming in buying homes because there isn't enough inventory out there on the market for people to buy. As far as my own thoughts, here's what I've noticed. I was able to sell two of my rental properties last year and there is a dramatic difference between the two. The first property was listed at the beginning of the year when interest rates were low and I priced it on the high end of what I thought I could get. Well, to my surprise, there were multiple offers over asking and it sold within a few weeks. Now, the second property was listed a little bit more towards the middle of the year after interest rates had already increased and it took a few weeks to get an offer below asking and then it sold a month later. All in all, I did not get as much as I could have gotten a few months earlier, but the change was pretty quick and I could absolutely understand how a buyer needs to prioritize affordability first. Separate from that, I've also been actively looking to purchase a commercial office space and to my utter amazement, it is still insanely competitive. I'm making the occasional offer here and there, but multiple properties are either already in escrow, already have an offer, or are getting multiple offers to accept the highest bid. This tells me that buyers are looking for alternative investments outside of stocks and treasuries that might be offering a better long-term yield. That also means there's not a substantial shift in pricing yet. Personally, I believe that real estate offers no incentive at a 6% return when risk-free treasuries are paying 45 to 5% with no work whatsoever. That's why I believe that prices will have to fall accordingly so that real estate offers a yield that compensates for the additional time and risk. I'm also seeing a lot of unfinished construction throughout the United States and I think that should begin to soften rental prices. So I think we have even more room to fall. That's why making offers at a price where I would be insulated if the market keeps falling further and until then, I'm just sitting on treasuries that are paying almost 5% at this point. One thing to keep in mind about Graham's statement right here is he is speaking from an investor perspective. Now, I completely understand his perspective, but we have to realize that as an investor, he is such in a minority group of the population that's buying homes right now. And those that are buying homes looking for maybe a first time home, move up home, for somewhere where they can live is gonna be a drastically different perspective than someone that is looking for an investment property. Because someone buying a home isn't gonna be sitting there and looking at the percentages off of returns and monthly rent out rates, things of that nature. They're looking to get into a home that they can afford, that they love. This was a great video by Graham and you know, final thoughts from myself is going back and reiterating just what we have seen in this first quarter in 2023. You know, we have been in the industry for over 30 years and some of the predictions that we even had towards the fourth quarter of last year, which was a very turbulent time for us, this was the best quarter we have had probably in the last year to two years. I mean, it was great from a sales perspective, even as a closing perspective in March. March was the best closing month that we've had in the last 12 to 18 months or so. So the market could be shifting. It could be a little blip. We don't know. And that's what a lot of these individuals are trying to do. They're trying to sit back and predict the future. And while, you know, they have a 50-50 chance, whether they're right or wrong, no one truly knows the future. We can just take the here and now and what we're seeing from a month to month perspective as a home builder. And so far, so good to start this year, guys. Graham, thank you so much for the video. Had a lot of thoughts on it. Really great video. Make sure to go check him out. But guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Make sure to turn on that bell notification for future videos so that you'll get notified and stayed up to date. And we'll see you guys on the next one.